Hello everybody, my name is Dan Sprenkels uh, and we'll be presenting the, the joint work here from uh, myself, Denise Kekonichi, Matthias Kanwischer uh, and our title is uh, Compact Dilithium on Cortex-M3 and Cortex-M4. Um, so um, I will be talking about our research which was implementing the Dilithium Signature Scheme on the Cortex-M4 and the Cortex-M3. I will give a brief introduction uh, on dilithium, um, uh, as there are probably people here that don't know what dilithium is and how it works, um, I will explain how the how we dealt with with non constant time multiplications um, on cortex M three and how we made multiplications in dilithium constant time. I'll briefly touch on the optimizing both the performance of these schemes and optimizing the memory of the schemes of the, of the scheme. Uh, I will go into the results and then I will conclude. So first, the, the lithium signature scheme. Um, it's obviously a signature scheme. Uh, it's part of the crystals uh, uh, submissions together with Kyber. And it's currently progressed to the third round of the NIST competition. Uh, the, the, the idea of the scheme is that it's a Fiat Shamir with abort scheme. It looks a lot like a general Fiat Shamir scheme. Um, but sometimes it can occur that the signature uh, is incorrect and it could leak something about the secret key. In these cases, we check it whether the signature is, is correct. And if the signature is incorrect, we restart the Fiat Shamir loop and we call one of these cases an abort. At some point, we will end up with a good signature. Uh, the underlying hard problems for dilithium are the module learning with error and the module shortest, in shortest integer solution problems. Uh, in general, dilithium, like most lattice schemes, it has very pretty small keys and pretty small signatures. Um, and the most important thing about dilithium is that it generally operates in this polynomial ring, which you see here on the slide, um, with this special prime uh, Q. The, the point of this ring, of using this ring, it is, is that it allows very efficient polynomial multiplication using the number the theoretic transform. So the number theoretic transform um, is basically a transformation which is done in a ring, um, which uh, basically, if you have a polynomial in, in your ring, um, then you can evaluate this polynomial at the powers of the nth primitive root of unity in this ring. Um, and then you will end up with another representation of the same polynomial. Um, the formal de definition you can see here on the slides, uh, these are all really complicated uh, multiplications and they're also inefficient. But in practice, what we do is we generally use the fast Fourier transform algorithm to compute the entity of a certain polynomial. What we, can then what we then can use is the fact that um, if we want to multiply two of these polynomials, um, we can we can transform both of these polynomials into the entity domain. Then we do pointwise multiplication and the resulting, the resulting polynomial, we can trans transform back into the time domain to get the product between, in this case, A and B. The benefit of this is that uh, while schoolbook multiplication has a, a complexity of uh, n squared, where n is the amount of coefficients in your polynomial, the entity and, and the inverse entity algorithms, they only have an n log n complexity, and then the pointwise multiplication has an n complexity. So using the entity is faster than using more traditional means of multiplication. Um, so the signature scheme itself obviously has three, three, three parts, the key generation, the signature, and the verification. Um, this is how it looks. I won't go into, into it too much, but the most important thing is that um, all these, these bold characters are vectors and matrices. Most of the involved operations in this scheme are vector, matrix, vector and matrix multiplications. And as such, uh, they use the, the scheme uses the entity a lot. Um, so then the target platforms. Um, we chose two different target platforms. 
first, uh, there's the ARM Cortex M4. We use the STM32407 Discovery board. Um, the this board is, I think, the main the main target for all the for all, for the NIST workshop schemes. I think NIST at some point said that in some, in some presentation. It's a 32-bit platform. It's uh, it, it has the ARM V7 instruction set. Um, it has a lot of ROM um, for microcontrollers and also a lot of RAM. Um, and it actually can is like uh, 168 megahertz because it's an M4. It has a couple of really nice instructions where you can do 32-bit multiplications in a single cycle. The ARM Cortex M3. So we used uh, an Arduino DUI, which has an Atmel SAM 3x8e chip. It looks a lot like the M4, but the main difference is that the flash size and the ROM size are a lot lower. And um, on the M3, there are not these nice uh, multiplications that multiply in one cycle. It has the same uh, same instructions, but they have variable runtime, which means that we cannot use them for side channel resistant code. How does that look? Well, we thought about maybe we can trick this instruction into into doing all this stuff correctly. Um, but apparently, the flowchart for uh, for this for this this these instructions, for example, for this one. Um, is so involved that it's really hard to uh, to actually trick this. And if we want to make sure that we always end up, for example, in the five cycle path, then it's really then it's almost impossible to to properly implement crypto with this. So the first the first obstacle to overcome was how do we actually implement constant time multiplications on the Cortex M three. Um, so yeah, basically the normal instructions for 64-bit multiplications are um, do not have a constant cycle count. But there are some 16-bit multipliers that are actually constant time. So the MUL instruction is one cycle and the MLA and the MLS uh, instructions, which MLA does accumulate and MLS does subtraction, they are both two cycles. And our solution is to use 32-bit multipliers and we represent the 64-bit values in radix to the power 16. So what we basically do is we do normal schoolbook multiplication, which is what you will see here. Um, and it kind of looks like this. One of the one of the important things is that while you can do this for the values that we have used in uh, in our dilithium implementation, it is not universal. And we could only do this because the values in our dilithium implementation were bounded by some specific bounds. and that made using that we could make sure that no overflows would happen um like especially uh overflowing uh, in the addition here is i think um something that can happen okay so that is basically how we implemented the um um uh the multiplication in the end i will describe another trick that we thought of but um didn't end up using because it didn't actually work. Um, so for optimizing the performance, the, the three main tricks that we used were, or that we at least tried is first we applied, try to apply this Chinese remainder theorem to actually split larger numbers into smaller numbers. Second trick is that we moved from an unsigned to a signed representation based from the from the previous implementations that we are that our implementation was based on and then the last implementation that we did is in the number theoretic transform uh, computations we merged the layers um we merged different layers of the entity so that we had to do minor less <laughs> loads and less stores so first applying the chemist remainder theorem so this trick is based on uh, on the code from n through prime um and the, the idea is as follows. First, um, we want to compute C equals A times B, where C, A, and B are all polynomials, which have 256 coefficients. Um, you would do that in dilithium by first computing the number theoretic transform of A, and then use, and also you computing the number theoretic transform of B. Then you do the pointwise multiplication of A and B, um, which gives C 
which is fast. And then in the end, you do the inverse entity of C, which gives you the normal uh, representation of C back. Um, the, the downside of this in, in the Cortex M3 is that all these multiplications are modulo Q. And Q is 23 bits. So for these multiplications, we need a 64-bit multiplier, uh, as in we need to multiply two 32-bit numbers and get a 64-bit uh, result. Um, and then we have to use the school book method that we that I described earlier, of we or we have to use one of these big multipliers, which is actually kind of slow. So the idea is as follows. <clears throat> Instead of computing uh, all the numbers modulo Q, we we generate a new we we take a new uh, Chinese remainder theorem basis where we have different Qs that all support um, number theoretic transforms. And what we do is for each uh, polynomial, we take the representation modulo some smaller entity friendly Q. Um, so for example, that would be the Kyber Q or the New Hope Q. What we can then do is uh, make sure that like if these, if these Qs are actually smaller than 16 bits, um, we can use the fact that like that they they are smaller to 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 uh, circumvent using these really big multipliers. Um, so what we do in that case, or what we would do in that case, is we take each of these polynomials modulo some smaller q, um, uh, this modulo like we we would take multiple versions of the same polynomial modulo different smaller q's. For each of these polynomials, we compute the entity. And we do the, the multiplication using the same method as always. And in the end, um, we use the Chinese remainder theorem to construct the C polynomial back from, from, the, from the CRT basis. Um, so the requirements for this to work is that all of these Qs, they have to be entity friendly primes. So there is actually not a lot of uh, values that that are smaller than 16 bits and are also entity friendly, but we, we managed to find some. Um, but also because the, the, the CRT basis has a larger, uh, is, is, is not, because in the C CRT, we are not representing the same ring anymore. Uh, we are actually computing in the integers and not modulo the regular Q. Um, so for this trick to work, the product of these these different primes has to be larger than the coefficients in C before they are reduced. Um, for the lithium, this would mean that we had to to come up with four different Qs and have to split our polynomials each into four different shares. Uh, we found out that it is actually slower to do this than just using the the other than, than using the schoolbook multiplication. But we want to stress that this is actually probably useful for other platforms, and we recommend you to see if, for your implementation, this would maybe work. Um, so the other, the other performance upgrade that we did is we moved from unsigned to signed representation. Basically easy. Um, we, every, time a, um, uh, every time if you have an unsigned implementation, you sub do a subtraction, then it's possible for this, this subtraction to overflow. So what you do is you mitigate this by adding a, a multiple of Q every time. Um, when you have to do this, then every time you need to do an extra addition. But furthermore, you also have to you also have to do more reductions because be, you are constantly adding this multiple of Q. Uh, that that means that your numbers are growing faster, and that means that in you, in the end you have to do more reductions. Um, so we found that for the Cortex M3 and the Cortex M4. We can easily just implement all the all the entities and all the math in signed representation, um, and so we move to signed representation. So there's no extra additions, and there's less reductions in the end. Um, and the last the last main optimization that we did uh, is that um, the entity is implemented using the finite sorry is using the fast Fourier transform algorithm. And the fast Fourier transform algorithm, basically it recurs as a binary three. Um, you can compute it in different ways. If you would compute this in a depth first manner, that means that you have to do a lot 
of reloads of different uh, different primitive views of Unity. And these reloads actually take quite a lot of time if you if you're working on an embedded platform like this. If you do this breadth first, then um, you are uh, you're constantly loading and spilling uh, coefficients of the polynomial that you're actually transforming to the NTT domain. So that's also not very nice. So the hybrid approach to do to to fix this is that you're going to merge layers. So see here a uh, a representation of the fast Fourier transform algorithm. Um, there's different ways to do this. This would be the breadth first me method, where first you you do the first layer, and then you do the second layer, and then you do the third layer. But you can also um, do this hybrid approach where you you first uh, transform, do butterfly operations uh, over the first coefficients of a layer, then immediately do the same, do the next butterfly operations for the next layer. And then you basically um, interleave those computations and merge this layer. That's what we what we recall. You can also merge these layers, you merge three layers, two layers, etc., depending on what you think uh, will be the fastest. So in our case, um, what, what happens is the amount of layers that you can merge depends on how, har how high your register pressure is. Um, and our register pressure is, is higher on the M3. So when the, on the M3, we were not able to merge a couple of layers, but on the M4, where we could use these big instructions, and on the M3, where we could use those same instructions, but we ended up with non-constant time uh, NTT implementations, there we could actually merge two different layers. So apart from performance, we also optimize memory. Um, the first, the first uh, strategy that we that we thought of is is um, wh when you're implementing one of these schemes in the wild. How would you actually do this? Uh, and we thought if you if you're writing a signature, if you're if you're uh, generating a signature, then your secret key is probably static, and you only have one secret key. So in the Dalithium specification, it's common to fully expand um, the big public matrix that you will need um, immediately in the beginning of the algorithm and pre-compute that whole thing. Uh, this is very annoying for stack space because um, you, will, you will need a lot of kilobytes of stack space during this, this operation. So um, what we thought of is, well, if this A matrix is always the same, then you can just write it down to flash or to ROM and you can just reuse it from flash all the time. You don't have to have the ROM for that. Um, that's what strategy one is. Strategy two is basically the same as the lithium spec says, we generate A once during signing and then we use it during a single signature. And the last one is basically we stream A and Y. Um, it's very likely that we get a very small uh, small stack stack footprint, um, but we expect this scheme to be a lot slower. Um, so basically the, the, the biggest bottleneck for stack optimization, optimization is this W equals A times Y. So we found that if you do mild stack optimization, then either you have to have W completely in RAM or you would have to have Y completely in RAM. Um, so that means that you always have either K or L uh, um, kilobytes of polynomials always around. So that is kind of a lower bound to, that we expected if, you, if you're not going for the abysmal performance. Um, so after implementing all this, uh, these are our results. Um, we, we, we measured using, on the M4, we measured using the statistic timer. Um, on the M3, the, we used the W the DWT cycle counter. Um, and how we measured stack was we filled the stack with dummy values, we run the algorithm, and we count how many of these dummy values were overwritten. Uh, for the NTT, we we kind of, we sped up uh, a little bit uh, compared to the previous work. And we see that that the, the constant time um, M4, uh, sorry, the constant time M3 NTT is like three times as slow as the M4 implementation and the variable time entity performance is 
about two two times as slow. Um, so for the M4, um, we have these speeds and, and stack uh, values and compared to the previous work, um, I will, these are all the numbers, you can read them here. Um, basically on the Cortex M4, uh, we have the facet implementation for, for all that we have, at the time that we wrote this software, we had the fastest implementation for the Cortex M4. Um, we have like a 13 to, to 27 speed up uh, compared to one of the previous works and a 14 to 20% speed up to the other. Um, for, the, for the M3, we, we don't have anything to compare to. So I present to, do, to you the numbers here as is. Um, we see that for signatures, um, the signatures are actually 40% to 100% more cycles than the M4. So that's a good guess if you want to estimate how slow this scheme would be on the Cortex M3. But we also see that verification is only 20% slower. And that is because we don't need, in the verification, we don't need to use constant time operations. And so that means that the over the extra overhead that we get because we cannot use the 64-bit multiply operations is less, is lower. Uh, for the memory, um, we we see that the key generation and verification are always pretty cheap. Um, but for 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 signing, we also we generally need 40 to 70 kilobytes of memory, depending on the version of that lithium. Um, and we see that in if we put some of that stuff in flash, then we can save 24 to 48 kilobytes of memory, um, which can be very useful. Um, we can get signing around down to around 10 kilobytes without optimizing a lot, like without actually, um, without actually um, compromising the performance of the scheme anywhere. Um, and for, for a factor of like, if we do signatures, and for a factor of three times or four times, we can actually say 40 to 60 kilobytes, uh, kilobytes of RAM. Um, so the conclusion, um, so this, we implemented this dilithium scheme on Cortex-M3 and Cortex-M4. We have quite fast results, um, but we think that the memory footprint is still quite large. Um, so there might be some research done to to move this, move this, like to get this this uh, even smaller. We didn't take into account that there could be a hardware accelerator on the platform. Um, we we did all the catch-up evaluations in software, which is really slow. If you have a hardware accelerator, this might be really fast. Um, and we think it's a shame that we could not use the CRT trick because uh, I think that we think that it could be very useful in some of these post quantum. Uh, well, in some of the NIST lattice schemes, um, so we hope to see more of that in the future. Um, the link to the paper is on the slide. We also have the code on GitHub. Um, and uh, I think the questions are asked in the, in the chess, after the chess short talk. And feel free to send us an email if you have any more questions. Thank you.